thank you guys for your, <laughs> your patience. Um, all right, well, I'm thrilled uh, to spend time with, with Katie today. For those of you who are, do not know, Katie is the CEO and managing partner of The Engine. Um, she was also the managing director of Techstars Boston and the founder and managing director of Project 11 Ventures. She has a long history in technology prior to that um, and also serves as the chairman of the Startup Institute, um, where she's also the founder. So uh, when I was dive, uh, about to dive deep into getting to know Katie, I kept seeing this recurring theme of tough tech. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. I've spent my entire career, like all of you, in tough tech. But it turns out I haven't. So tell us, tell us what tough tech is. Yeah, so when we think of tough tech, I mean, the engine was founded to kind of tackle this gap between the lab and commercialization for tough technologies. And those are things that are coming out of true research universities. They're breakthrough technologies. They often involve the physical world, you know, so anything out of the physical sciences or really complicated software systems, so what we call deep software. I need a better word for it, but that's all I know. Um, and they often have longer time frames to market and they involve humans and machinery together in general. So think about next generation fusion power plant. Um, think about true AI systems that could deliver self-driving cars. Whether we think that's a good thing or not, that's something that is going to come to us, but it takes a lot of time and effort and many highly skilled people to build startups like this. And you know, most of society's biggest problems that are solved by science involve tough technology. Uh, and so if you, you are on the MIT campus right now, but many of the great research labs in tough tech are within a stone's throw of here, whether it's in fusion, whether it's in biology, chemistry, you know, it's all about how do you feed the world's people, how do you get them water, you know, how do you, how do you get energy? All of these things have huge improvement on human life, uh, and that's beyond educating and many other things. But we focus on those because they're really out of favor in uh, the investment world. You know, there's a lot of money being put towards pure software or services, and if you think about how do we stay relevant in the world, actually services are nice, but they don't develop a long-term stable economy. It's really being at the edge of breakthrough technology. It's the reason we have had such a long period of affluence has been, you know, US government pumping money into all of our labs, our educational system really educating people to work collaboratively and creatively together that has brought the prosperity we have now. And unfortunately, and I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a minute about tough tech, is that if we don't continue funding those things at the level or beyond that we have, we will fall behind. And, you know, China was just brought up. I mean, they're, I don't, I'm not making China the boogeyman. I'm just saying th it's a really important competitive set. And if you don't think that other regions of the world are really going after tough technologies and educating their workforce to work in those technologies because they know that was the core of our prosperity, you know, you're kind of, your head's in the sand. And so we believe that, you know, the engine was founded to really work with these technologies, work with founding teams that want to see them come to market in some, something like a five to 30 year time frame. And um, so that's what we're doing and that's what Tough Tech is. Thank you, that was a great overview. So tell us a little bit more about the engine. I just, I find the model fascinating. It's not just a fund, it's so much more. So, you know, I think uh, the folks at MIT, Raphael Reif, who's the president, and his kind of core team, along with the board, really looked at you know, the trends of what was happening with funding in these tough tech areas. 
and you kind of cry when you look at it because it's like uh, funding towards software like apps, maybe social apps, maybe maybe things that actually are, are more utilitarian than that, rising. And you see pharmaceutical numbers rising. But if you look at almost everything else, the numbers were going down, down, down in terms of actual venture dollars and post-venture dollars going into un enterprises like that. And if your mission, which MIT's mission is impacting the world, like true world impact, you, you just see you gotta, you gotta get at that problem of how do you bridge that funding gap and how do you inspire the next generation of students and kids beyond that to work on important problems. And um, that has everything to do with workforce development, but it also has to do with inspiration. And so I think there was a beautiful confluence. You know, if you look at this generation coming out of universities right now, you see, at least what I see is, a lot of, and I'm making a broad generalization, but I get to work with this generation. So you see people really committed, wanting to work on meaningful projects. And so I think, you know, the engine was kind of this confluence of like, let's try to reverse this trend and let's work on really meaningful things that could make the entire world better and not just in a Facebook way, you know, but like, hey, could, it, could we tackle the problem of developing true clean energy for the world? Could that be accessible to everyone? Could we produce enough water for the world, clean drinking water? Could we produce enough food? You know, all these are like, these are big, heady problems, right? But you gotta go after them by backing entrepreneurs and companies that could become very important and very profitable companies, but they're gonna take time to get there uh, because of the infrastructure needed. So to back up and say, what is the engine? The engine is a venture capital fund plus a set of infrastructure that our uh, entrepreneurs have access to, which is both infrastructure that we build, so labs and, and fabrication space so they can build the things they need to build, plus access to many of the most expensive equipment that these companies only need episodically. So if you're building a company that you're gonna send something into space, you cannot simulate that with gravity. Um, so you need chambers that you can test your equipment in. So, you know, there are many places right around us that have these chambers. So the question is, could we open these to entrepreneurs in a systematic way so that it would reduce the capital they needed to develop really important startups. So it's a set of infrastructure and then a network which includes, you know, a whole bunch of people who fund companies like this, experts to help, government, academia, all kind of working together on some of these really interesting problems and companies. Thank you, that was a great overview. Um, I'm wondering how you motivate investors and um, also the entrepreneurs in such a long cycle. I think in our pre-reading, there was this great article on how soul-crushing it is to be a public company <laughs> at times. So I'd love to better understand. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, actually my job is a lot easier than that. I get to go and find people who are motivated themselves. You know, I pick entrepreneurs who this is truly their life's mission to make this happen. So I'll give you an example, probably one of our longer time frames, but Commonwealth Fusion is a company that spun out of MIT, out of the Plasma Fusion Center, about, I don't know, $5 billion over 50 years went into that lab. So very significant US government uh, funding into that. And they probably have a 15, you know, 12 to 15 year time frame to market. That doesn't mean that there will not be m very measurable inflection points in their valuation along the way because each piece that they develop um, makes them a more valuable company. Uh, but, you know, if you're 30, 
four years old, you know, y your kids will be in high school by the time that happens, and y you might not have kids yet. <laughs> so uh, you have to find people that really understand what they're getting into, and they're so motivated as a team that, that they attract both capital and employees that will get on that mission with them. And, but in, in my experience, when you find entrepreneurs like that, they're able to do it. And yes, every entrepreneur has their down moments, but that, I mean, that sense of purpose, the sense that they are going to make a difference and that they're gonna have a business at the end of the day that will make a difference um, and be profitable and have world impact, that's pretty motivating. You know, and so I think it's not as hard as you think when you pick areas of import. So you spend a, a lot of time identifying talent, cultivating talent through your mentoring and the work. So what do you feel like are the top competencies that you look for in identifying talent? I think the, the very most important thing is that people understand why they're, they want to do something, that it's, it's, it's from the heart. And, or the gut, the soul, whatever you want to say. Some, some piece of you that has this kind of just, you don't quite know why, but you know you're going to get up every morning and do something and put your shoulder into it. And that, that's elusive, but in my experience, you can't fake it. You know, if, if and I've had a lot of people try to fake it with me, but you just see the people who actually get up every morning and and really care about what they're up to. I think that's the most important thing. If you ask me how to educate for that, I don't know. You guys know that a lot more better than I do. Um, I mean, I've, I'm also a mother of three kids, and you kind of can see it in your kids when they're really into something versus not, right? I mean, I think you know that. Then the second thing is, can they learn faster individually and as a team. And actually, the individual one's pretty easy to look at. Um, uh, and I don't mean being an A student. Being an A student's awesome, but it's in entrepreneurship. If that's all you've ever been, it's actually a sign that you're going to fail as an entrepreneur. Because I think the number of days you wake up and get a B or C, or maybe even an F, are most days. You know, your A's are few and far between, so if you're motivated by somebody else's rubric, you're in trouble. Uh, because it's just soul, it can be soul crushing for people like that. Like, I have therapy for A students. I'm like, okay, great. You got a C today, how does that feel? <laughs> we go through a month of C's and if they're still good, all right, they might be an entrepreneur. Um, the second piece is is can they work with other humans? And, and in the last discussion, we were talking about soft skills. It is it is the number one critical thing. The reason startups fail is failure of communication between human beings. Very few times is it truly the technology. Because, you know, sure, sometimes the tech fails. 98% of the time, that's not the real failure mode. It's that they don't know how to collaborate, communicate, make decisions, um, face what's what they can't handle, uh, learn to get along with other people, learn to see the genius in others. I mean, these are all those really, really core soft skills. So that's the next set I look at. And then I look at the true work product. What do they get done? What is you know the fruits of their labor? And if you kind of see mission, you know, a team that can work together, and then some a group that can actually get things done, that's, a, that's just a beautiful indicator of the future, the most powerful indicator of the future. And so, um, you know, that's why it doesn't, these kind of investments don't happen. Like, oh yeah, I'll meet you Saturday morning, and y you know, the investment's done by Saturday at 4 p.m. You know, all the stuff you see in Silicon Valley, like, oh, yeah, we did the deal at the In-N-Out Burger. You're like, really? <laughs> Didn't you have to kind of talk to the team a little longer than that? But, 
but you can do that in quote business model innovation, like a services business, where you're like, that's a good idea. You can, I know you can do that. It's just software. And the kinds of things we do, that's not true. Um, and then last is, and this is, I always leave this last because deep knowledge matters. Uh, you know, we're working with physicists and chemical engineers and biologists and biochemists and um, applied mathematicians. I mean, these, these people have studied their art and their science for at least a decade after high school, at least, if not much, much longer. And that depth of knowledge and depth of what has been tried before and failed, you can't actually shortcut it. And so, you know, we look at that too. How were they trained and who did they train with and who's really pushed on their idea? So that's it's a little bit different in tough tech than straight software. Yeah, that's really, it's really helpful to, to hear kind of that holistic picture, which traditional school covers some of, but obviously not the majority, the majority of. Um, having just finished Bad Blood, <laughs> for those of you who haven't read it, I think Sundance a really good movie is coming out on it. Um, it's about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. And um, what struck me throughout that whole book was, first of all, like the how do you evaluate ethics in an entrepreneur? Um, and then secondly was the due diligence. Like, why didn't any investor or board member just go get their finger pricked and compare it to a blood test? So I'd love to better understand your view on evaluating ethics and, and how you look at that. Well, first let's talk data and then we can talk ethics. Um, when we evaluate a team coming out of a scientific lab, we are actually looking at data. <laughs> and that would have been a pretty easy way to avoid the, the original Elizabeth Holmes problem, which is that somebody should have just, I mean, that's almost always our first round of funding is, hey, you don't quite have enough data. Let's do a small round. Let's figure out and look at your data. And all look at each other in in the face and say, "Is the data good? Is it good enough to back a company for?" So, like, you avoid a lot of problems by doing that, or actually doing the diligence. So, you know, much of my team is made up of PhDs who can take almost any technology, tear it down, talk to the world's experts on it, and try to get a real sense: Is it real? Is it doable? Is it does it break the law of the physics? On ethics, ethics is really tough. But, um, you know, and I think we all kind of worship the, the young, you know, striving entrepreneur. You know, like Mark Zuckerberg in his heyday, um, which is there's something about that that just has mystique. And Elizabeth Holmes had that mystique. And I think people kind of forget their brain in those moments and they, greed takes over. Uh, but I think you can determine if someone has a pattern of ethical behavior by talking to the people they've worked with and know, which is what we do. And you know, you don't catch 100% of it that way, but I think you know a lot about how someone treats others, how they've behaved, in, in a classroom, how they've behaved in other companies before this. And, um, you know, entrepreneurship, if you look at the Kaufman studies on this, uh, who makes great entrepreneurs? Um, hustlers, which they call criminals, I don't believe that, and dyslexics. Why? Because their brains think really, really differently. Um, I think hustler's more the right term, and that term is really, that you can see the future before others and help people to understand what that future would look like, even if it's not here yet. And I think some people in the hustler category get caught up in believing themselves too early. And I actually think that's the Elizabeth Holmes original story, and then it kind of got all crazy. Um, it's To me, it's really unfortunate that one of the, like, female entrepreneurs who really got kind of risen up in the press is just being decimated. It's all her fault. I'm not, uh, I'm not excusing her in any way. It's just, do you know how many guys have done that? And were they decimated in that way by the press? Not really. 
Uh, so that that's an unfortunate. Um, I mean, it makes a great story, but but this stuff goes on, and and it is the job of your backers and your board to really hold you to account for not the fake news you give, like oh yeah, it's going to be out in two months, but the hard data. I mean, that is your job as a board member. So there was a true failure on that board. That story hasn't been told, which is interesting. Well, the edges of it certainly have been, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. So build, building on that theme, one of the key things I noticed about your team is just how diverse your team is. And then I looked at the whole portfolio, and your portfolio is incredibly diverse as well. So I'd love to understand how you've been able to cultivate that with all the other criteria you're looking for. Well, um, when I was first starting the engine, uh, I have a board member, Sue Siegel, who has been a really wonderful mentor, and I asked her, okay, Sue, we're gonna put our money where our mouth is. How are we gonna, how am I gonna recruit a diverse team? And she was like, that's the simplest, uh, that's not even a question. And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, just hire people, hire a diverse team, it's not that hard. And, you know, I've been doing it my whole career, so this is not new. But I thought in, uh, in, a, in a larger venture for maybe there's a trick here. And she's like, there's no trick. Uh, if you put the word out and interview broadly and fairly, there, there is no pipeline issue of, you know, qualified women or underrepresented minorities. There just, there just really isn't. So that's just a lie we tell ourselves. Um, look at what our educational systems have done in terms of diversity. It's extraordinary. And there's no excuses, in my mind, in, in 2019. Uh, so I think every group that is dominated by, you know, either one race or one gender um, that's been in power for a long time, I think those shifts are coming. I just wake up, go look, go talk to your kids. You know, I have a 20, 18, and 14 year old. My oldest are two boys. When they come home, they don't talk about girls being like, oh, yeah, they weren't that good at math. They're like, oh, yeah, they kicked my butt on that math test. You know, so they see girls as not, you know, m at least they're equal academically and in the workforce. And I just think they're going to bring that mentality all the way through. And I think you, you see that all the way up to about 35 in your 40s, it's a little shaky, 50s even shakier, 60s, we haven't seen that change yet. But that wave is, is coming, and, and so I, I think um, all of our founding teams, if, like, there are many of the sciences that are still dominated by men in, in engineering programs in the later stages of PhD programs, but even those teams come out and look at the engine team and they're like, wait a second, you guys are amazing, help us find women. And we're like, great, we'll help you find women. Um, and so I just think that's gonna be the world we live in and it's so awesome. All right, last question and then I'll, I'll open it up to the group. Um, so you're speaking to a group of people who are shaping your future, tough tech leaders, and, and also potentially, you know, kind of reskilling current ones. So help us understand, you know, just give us some advice on, on how we can help you. So if you look at the true frontier technology space, you know, uh, quantum, you look at uh, fusion, like any of the, like all the really awesome stuff coming down in biology, the number one concern that entrepreneurs have after they get funded is you realize we don't have a strong enough talent pipeline, right? We're not gonna be able to hire all the people we need to actually build this when we're successful. Can you go talk to the MIT president? Literally, I've had like five entrepreneurs say this to me. I'm like, um, I think you're waiting a little long, guys. You need to be worried about the fifth graders right now. And uh, and to me, I think, you know, it's that inspiration. Like I've watched my kids through primary school and high, you know, is high school primary school? All right, whatever. <laughs> secondary. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, through secondary school, and 
they have had the most incredible English teachers and history teachers and even math teachers and science teachers. But if you think about being inspired by what's truly coming, you don't really get that in school in a big way. And so I think that's the heart of motivation. And so the question is, how do we bring that inspiration? Because I think kids want a purpose. They, I mean, they want to feel connected to something of meaning. I, I think that's innate in human beings. And so the, qu I, the, the thing to me is, how do we inspire them to care about the right set of issues and, and find those people? You know, so we do tours all the time with like, we just gather kids and like, let's go over to the plasma fusion center and look at a react, you know, a, one of the first tokamaks. And the kids get in there and they're like, what? This is so cool. This is right in the middle of Cambridge. Like, that's what we need. We need them to feel curious. And I, I, my experience is all the, the teachers I know have great intentions, but they don't know themselves in the same way about what's coming down in frontier technology. And God, there's so much, I get it. But I, I really believe the jobs are gonna be there if people are inspired. They need all kinds of thinkers, doers. I, it's, it's, it's the inspiration and kind of finding your way to these, these uh, paths that I think are important. the risk for the investors that come after you by taking that really long, hard kind of investment. And so we have an investment gap in education, startups too, and, and uh, you know, do you have any advice for us for how we can move from a place where maybe 1.5% of the total venture going into, um, going into the, going, is in education now, finally, and, um, and still the, the GDP is in the seven, eight, nine percent. So, so we really need to put more capital into this education system that can do change, not just the everyday um, pay the teacher capital, we need to put the other capital in the Any ideas? So, you know, when I think about kind of long-term thinking. I mean, I think that's been one of the things, and it's not just this administration. I actually think it goes back pretty far into the 70s where we kind of started to give up on some of our real long-term investing in, in into kind of next generation thinking. Um, but I think there's a whole bunch of things that are relevant to tough tech that are also relevant to education tech. And it's kind of like, hey, what, are, what is, if you think 20 years from now, what is the shift? Why isn't there a pool of money that the US government is really deploying either alongside investors into early stage companies? Like it's those big powerful shifts that'll make a difference. That's not to say you don't deploy capital earlier, but it's like these public-private partnerships, like why can we do one on SpaceX and not do one on the most important places in education? And and Gene, I think the, the really important thing here is kind of an inspirational view. I do think a lot of this is storytelling on big shifts and big changes. And you know, we all worship Elon, and really Elon Musk is a great storyteller. And that is why he has been able to amass capital. I mean, his cars are awesome, SpaceX is awesome, but that story attracted great people that then attracted money from all kinds of walks of life, whether it's US government or venture. And I think with education, it's like, I think some of that inspiration, some, some of these ideas are too small, they're too micro. So what are the big shifts? What could, how could we leap forward in that, um, whether it's on the private or the public sector? I don't know, that's, I just think all, everything comes back to that. And I think if we can inspire, we can, money, money goes toward inspiration. End of story. Barely being advantaged 
advantage of that investment that the United States is taking up? Or do you see, do you, the entrepreneurs you work with fear that till the point of commercialization or when they get their tough day into the hands of potentially day-to-day -day users or corporations or governments or whatever, that in between that time, uh, the novelty of their invention gets to because of external countries and other factors? How do you protect against that? And literally spent the morning on exactly that topic. Uh, yes, it's the existential fear, like is, are our patent links long enough for these really transformative technologies? I mean, certainly the answer is no. Should a patent for software and a patent for a next gen fusion power plant be the same? Kind of seems silly to me. Does it seem silly to you? One needs almost no investment, the other needs billions of dollars of investment. But that's, that's going to take a while. And in lieu of any changes in the patenting office, um, I think people have to be protective. And you know, most, many of these projects are very secretive. And they have to be for that exactly that reason. Uh, and it's one of the key risks. You know, many startups have market risk, technology risk. In ours, there's kind of information leakage risk that is more than technology risk. And there's also regulation risk. And so, yeah, these are existential problems. And that's why you gotta, you gotta believe in somebody's plan to get to market before you can invest in these things. And, um, and you've gotta understand how they're gonna protect it against, you know, the disclosures that will inevitably be there because of the patenting process. But on the other hand, there aren't many people who could assemble s you know, a really difficult project too. There's a lot of know-how in, a s there's a lot of secret sauce there as well. So that sometimes get you, gets you beyond that. But yes, these are real problems. You know, you look at what's happening in China. There's two main trends there that I think are could be awesome for the world or could be really detrimental to the world. One is there's a long-term technology stand. Like these are the areas we're gonna we care about and we are gonna pour money into educational institutions that are gonna produce products in these areas. And we're gonna train people to do that. Like it is straight up, there is a single plan and we're going and we're gonna dump money in. Uh, and And I think the greatest hope for the world is that the Chinese actually become inventors because I think having multiple places where important technology is invented should be good for the world, not bad for the world. Um, I think we still, in our minds, think of them as copying everything and incapable of creating their own. I do not believe that's true, and I don't think any of you should either. Um, I think they know the soft skills that need to be taught. I think they're at least a generation, if not two generations behind the US in teaching soft skills and collaboration. They will catch up very quickly. And if we can figure out how not to fight with each other, that should be a really good thing. But you know, that I'm that's way above my pay grade. I don't know how to do that. Hopefully somebody here does. But I think you know, we should see China as a long-term collaborator, and we are competing, but it's coopetition, right? Like we are cooperating and competing, and and that's a a trend that you know, if 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 we don't figure out a way around making it us versus them, uh, that's not good for any of us or our kids. You know, I don't know. That was a big answer to your. All right, I think we're out of time. Katie, thank you so much. That was really inspiring.